Welcome to the ADNA Presents. Today we have a very special guest, Margot Tone. She is joining us for this interview. I'm so excited to have Margot. She is the senior producer at Descriptive Video Works and has so much experience in audio description, coming from the senior manager of operations at Audio Description for Deluxe. And I, I'm so excited to have you, Margot. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. What do you love about audio description? Oh, my Lord. I started out as a journalist, right? And I used to write profile pieces on celebrities and designers. So when you do that, you're very observant of the surroundings of what's going on. So a, a little bit of that really helped me when I got into audio description. And even prior to that, I was in the scripting department and I oversaw dubbing scripts. So what we would do is we would create a master English script that would be used for dubbing. And then those scripts, what was important is you would have to explain what a colloquialism was or slang so that when it's translated, it can be translated accurately to capture the context. So if you say something like, oh, you know, get off your high horse. Well, somebody in Spain or a translator is going to go, what does that mean? Is it literal? Like, get off the horse? So we would annotate it and say, no, this means quit being arrogant. I kind of had this like path. And when my boss actually at the time, he said, hey, do you want to learn audio description? I said, okay. I had heard a wee bit of it when I was at Technicolor where I was doing scripting there. And I'll never forget uh, when my colleague said, listen to this. And it was an episode of Lost. And it was so fascinating. But then nothing ever came of it. So when this came about, I like immediately was like, absolutely. I went and went to Louisville, Kentucky, I'm from Kentucky. So, you know, went to the hometown and trained with Joel and learned the basics, the concepts, the idea of it. The best part of that for me was watching a movie with audio description with a blind audience. That feeling that I had, you know, listening to them laugh at certain parts and just that knowing of, of how it was helping somebody with my love for writing and for words, it just was, I don't know, it's like a perfect marriage. So I came back and wrote and trained. And then after that, then it was like, now we need to start a department. So that's where my position from writing went to managing. Now we're trying to put together the best writers, the best narrators, because our goal was always, we want to give the best AD that we can. I am so lucky because I always had support from, you know, my managers at Deluxe. We just were really, really lucky. So there you go. So that's, that's kind of how all that started. Oh, wow. This is so great. And to hear that support from the managers, to hear the experience that you had, even back in the celebrities and the profiles that you specifically mentioned observant and I'm fascinated if you could go into some of the assumptions that you had going into audio description, particularly with that background. You made a point about experiencing movies and, and films with the blind audience when you went to the training and learned the basics. I'm wondering about any assumptions that you had and how those assumptions were changed by working with the blind audiences by collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, maybe some assumptions that were true. One thing was, is I had to get out of my ego as far as writing. I'm not writing for me. I'm writing for a specific audience. And you got to watch this program in a completely different way. And that takes some time because there are assumptions made as a sighted viewer. You know, for me, it's asking questions and getting feedback from the blind community and, and having people say, you know, <laughs> my favorite thing was they said, if, if somebody is outside, you don't need to tell us, we can tell. So it's just kind of doing that writing to get exactly to the point that you need to make sure that the blind viewer knows exactly what's going on. So, you know, it's just learning to look at it in a different way. And you want to give the viewer the same experience as a sighted viewer as much as you can. So, and I know there's two different camps. There's some people that just say, just write what's going on. We don't need all the frills, but... Sometimes you do, you know, like you've been walking a room and it's like, what if the room has neon signs on the walls or, or there's dead bodies laying around or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's that, that extra color, I think really helps. 
Well, without giving any spoilers, could you share a little bit about what it was like for you going from writing to managing? Obviously, just even talking about the casting decisions on who's going to voice the scripts and, and how the scripts are written, you've got a really good overview of the entire audio description creation. And I'm wondering about how managing audio description, especially with your background in writing, what sort of things that came up, maybe even a challenge that you've gone through that you're really proud of how you overcame it in the way that you managed the audio description? Well, I'll tell you that one of the big challenges was dealing with the clients, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was so lucky that I had such an incredible team at Deluxe. When I went to Descriptive Video Works, it was that passion that they had. So that's what I look for. It's like that desire to do the best you can. Um, but I digress. Anyway, what I was going to say with clients, what I found out is they needed to be trained too, because they would say, well, why didn't you talk over this dollar? Or why didn't you put this description in? And I'd have to say, but if I put that description in, that we're going to go over pertinent dialogue and you don't go over dialogue. That's the number one rule. So it was educating the client to a certain extent. And I have to say, for the most part, I had a really good experience with all the clients. They got it. It took some time because it would be, well, can you get this done in uh, two days? No. <laughs> and this is why, you know, and I would explain to them, I said, you have to understand it's a process. You have the writing which can take anywhere from if it's a you know hour long, it can take a couple of days, depending on how difficult it is. Or if it's a feature, it can take five to six days. And because you want to get that research, you want it to be accurate, you want to call things by what they're supposed to be called. And um, the narrator has to do it. And then, you know, and then it has to be mixed. And then it has to be QC'd. So there's this process, because I would tell them, if you want a really quality project, then this is what needs to happen. And it is satisfying for you and your team to have those clients recognize the benefits of quality. Have you found that pivot away from a client hypothetically coming from the perspective of, we just want to make it as cheap and fast as possible, let's go, let's go, to what you're talking about of, of valuing the experience that the blind and low vision audiences have. have that's got to be satisfying. Have you found that as the clients are trained and educated, as long as that takes, that they are starting to be like, there's a connection, there's a light bulb that goes off and saying, oh, I get it. Do they get it? Yeah, they started to. And, and honestly, if the client didn't want to pay a certain amount, if they wanted to keep it really cheap, we'd say we, we can't do it. Skilled writers and narrators deserve to be paid for their, for their skill. And no synthetic voices. Boo. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, uh, the professional side of this, that you did say professional voice talents, professional writers, professional engineers for the mixing and the editing, professional quality control, that as more blind professionals are, you know, this work was created by blind people for blind people. Blind people need to be involved in it, not just as quality control, but there are many more blind professionals entering this field and respecting that profession. I'm curious about your experience in this really nuanced conversation, if we could even broach this, that there is a level of perception of what a profession means in the, the grand scheme of things. A professional person has the training and experience. You've given the uh, experience of you as a journalist, as a, a dubbing manager, as a writer of audio description, and now as a AD manager for several companies, that there is a skill level that you bring to that work that made you get hired. I'm wondering about that professionalism and how that goes up against but we just want to help this this helping in a negative sense the helping in the sense of let's treat this like a charity and don't you want to offer as much as you can to help uh, help in a negative context if that makes any sense it's really deep roy i love going deep if you don't want to go deep we can go shallow i'm happy do you mean like from the client perspective of saying you should just be doing this for free i think there is that perception I think there's that perception of, well, don't you want to give the, we've spent millions and millions of dollars of this content. Don't you, as the company that you work for, Margo, don't you want to give that for free to make sure that everyone can have access to it? That the responsibility seems to be shifting from, we had so much money to spend and now we don't, now that we're talking access. Yeah, no, it's right back at him, Roy. To me, it's like, no, don't you want your project don't you want your product or what you've done don't you want it to have the best of the best 
Don't you want the blind and uh, low vision audience and the millions out there? Don't you want them to be able to sit in a theater and enjoy this and be able to say, oh my God, we heard the best? No, it's back to them. We'll make deals and we'll work with them. I mean, it, it, because it's a business, you know, and I understand that. And it's like, look, we get volume, we'll do this and that. But the other side is we don't want to put our name on something that's not good. Really well said. Thank you for figuring out the, the message that I was trying to ask you. And you know what? And sort of kind of related to that is I went to the theater just to listen to the AD and it didn't work. And oh my God, it was so mad. <laughs> so I went after and I went to the guy and I went, I want to speak to your manager. Because I said, if I was blind and I went in and sat down and then it didn't work, now I'm going to miss the movie because now I got to go back down, get you all to figure it out and then go back. So yeah, I really thought, what is the point there? You have all this back post work being done. And then when it gets to the theater, you know, I think they need to train people or be prepared because that's, yeah, that was frustrating. Yeah. You just wanted to see the film. You didn't want to have to spend 15 minutes trying to watch the film. It's like... And then nobody knew anything. And it's just like, you should have a sheet of paper that says directions on how to do this. Sure. And instead of that sheet of paper, it seems like a lot of our blind audiences are just getting gift certificates to come back and experience that horrific experience yet again. Yeah. Don't advertise that you have AD if you don't know how to give it to them. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh. That seems like a very simple. <laughs> Has the AD symbol on there. You better, you better back it up. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about assumptions, right? Yeah. 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 This is great. Well, it seems like the shift that's happening, at least your contribution to the shift of prioritizing, you know, if you put your name, your name being the company you work for or your actual name or the writers or whoever's working on the project, if you're putting your name on it, that puts a, a stake in the ground of a certain level of expectation that you brought to it. And that tells me that the shift is happening from how cheap we can make this work to how great we can make it. How great can audio description be? And you've mentioned so many examples of your contribution to what the craft of audio description means to you and your team. Where would you like to see this go as far as audio description, either personally or your company, or what's uh, what's something that we could have some, some hope <laughs> that things are going in the right direction here? Obviously, I want AD everywhere. I've been at Descriptive Video Works just for a couple of months. Reese and that team are so connected in. They are striving to make it accessible in video games, in business, in education. I mean, you know, the sky's the limit. Live AD. I mean, my goodness, you know, and I've listened to some of the live AD that DVW's done, and it's, wow. When I listen to some of the work they did with the Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Annie and, you know, live, it is a skill. And I am so impressed with that. So that I'm really anxious to learn a lot about and, you know, in the video games and I'm really excited. It's so great. And also one of the things when it comes to doing the right thing is including blind professionals. The Descriptive Video Works has made a point that compensating professionals for their value, that they are being paid for their contribution to what the right thing is in all these aspects. Yes, so we have an advisory council, which is wonderful. And we're expanding and getting contributions from blind describers. And, and absolutely, you have to include blind low vision people or what's the point? You know, you've got to get their perspective and, and say, hey, do you like when this is done? Or do you like when you, you hear this? Or what is your favorite thing about AD? Or what bugs you? I love to hear that stuff because that's it guides us because that's who it's going to. So of course we're gonna listen. Thank you for saying that. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? No, I just, I appreciate what you do. I've listened to several interviews on here and it's the people who are really trying to make AD the best it can be, it's wonderful. It's just nice to see everyone trying to step up a bit. Now it's not just about getting audio description, you know, now it's now, you know, let's do good audio description. Let's make it the best it can be. And I really, really hope that becomes the focus as well. Not just expanding it, but making it the best it can be. That would be ideal. And I think we're moving in that direction. It's great to hear that. Uh, if we can follow you on social media, any websites, uh, maybe Descriptive Video Works, if you want to. Well, Descriptive Video Works, yeah. <laughs> So that's uh, descriptivevideoworks.com uh, yes. for their website. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Margo. 
My pleasure. Thanks for having me.